my predecessor, Joel Pritchard, in Congress and, and Bill Bell and Barney McCollum in 1965, got together and invented a whole new sport. This is now, the, I'm told, the most rapidly growing sport in the world today, and it was invented right here in Washington. So we're proud of the Boeing 707 software and pickleball. And uh, it's a great sport. It helps people keep uh, healthy. It's available to so many different people. And it keeps old basketball people playing pickleball. And I want to thank everybody involved in growing this sport. Uh, leaders like Clay Roberts on Bainbridge Island and others who are getting more courts uh, for folks. So I hope the legislature can make this uh, our official sport. Uh, turning to uh, a more pressing challenge, uh, which is COVID. Just to comment where we are on COVID. Uh, we know we are in a, still a very rapidly rising infection rate and rising hospitalization rates, which is extremely concerning. We know that there is some uh, good news around the world that some places uh, look like that they have hit a peak, uh, even in the United States. But we do believe we are in for several weeks of very hard slogging in Washington State where all of us have to pitch in together because we don't know where that peak will be. It's likely to be later than many places because this hit us later than many places in the United States. And the hospitalization rates will continue to go up even after the infection rate peaks because hospitalizations follow uh, the peak of the infection uh, rate. So we have some work to do in the next several weeks and we have some things we're gonna talk about today to help us through that difficult period. First, we want to talk about how to help our hospitals. Uh, hospitals and doctors have told us that their systems really are now in crisis because of this Omicron uh, uh, surge. And so we are responding to those concerns today in ways that we can help. We currently have over 2,000 COVID hospitalizations across the state, and COVID patients today make up about 18% of all the people in our hospitals and 22% of our ICUs. And unfortunately, those numbers are going to continue to climb. Now, we know roughly about 80% of those people, unfortunately, are not vaccinated. So there are many things we need to do to try to help our hospitals through this, uh, this crisis. Uh, first, we want to help them with staffing shortages. And this is really uh, most of the problem is not a, a physical logistics problem. It's a staffing shortage problem, both because of the increase in cases and because people who work in these hospitals are themselves becoming ill. So we know that the staff shortages have pushed hospitals beyond their capacity. Uh, so hospitals have told us that they believe having some National Guard personnel can help them. So I am ordering uh, 100 members of the Washington State National Guard. This is non-clinical personnel to across the state to help hospitals to assist in non-medical tasks to alleviate issues, particularly in their emergency departments, and also to add testing capacity at these hospitals to get the testing to alleviate the challenge in, the, in emergency departments. Uh, by the way, I note that this is non-medical personnel and we'd, we'd love it if we thought the Guard had, you know, tons of medical personnel. We do have some people who serve in our Guard that, that are medically trained, nurses and physicians, but it's not a solution to take those nurses and physicians out of their civilian employment, where they're today working in hospitals, put them in a Guard uniform, and then put them back just where they were working. That doesn't increase capacity. Uh, but we know the emergency rooms are full, more people are showing up all the time. We want to help hospitals handle the volume of patients. And we think that the Guard can help in a variety of tasks. We're going to, we're going to uh, call up the, these individuals for a month. We really appreciate them coming out of their civilian life to do this. They've been working really, really hard the last two years. And we appreciate their efforts. Uh, we're going to send that personnel uh, to Providence Regional Medical Center in Everett, to Yakima Valley Memorial Hospital in Yakima, to Confluence Central Washington Hospital in Wenatchee and Providence Sacred Heart in Spokane. Now, we'd also like to help by uh, doing some of the testing now to be doing hospitals, doing out outside the hospitals. So we're gonna deploy guard personnel to, to run those testing operations. Uh, we've heard that many from the hospitals and many people with COVID symptoms are seeking testing in the emergency departments. We wanna alleviate that pressure on the emergency departments. 
So those testing teams will be placed at Providence St. Peter Hospital in Olympia, Cadillac Regional Medical Center in Richland, UW Medicine Harborview uh, in, in Seattle, and Multicare Tacoma General Hospital. It'll take uh, a week or so to set up those testing centers and what we're doing as fast as we can to get them set up. We're also, of course, pleased that uh, we're going to have FEMA mass testing sites being set up in King and Snohomish County. Now, we're looking for other ways to help as well. Um, one of our, our problems uh, in our hospital capacity is we today have quite a number of patients who are ready to discharge uh, to other types of lower uh, intensive care, but we don't have a place for them to go. So we want to increase the capacity of the state to give people additional places to go after their discharges to still receive the care that they need. Now, those are our long-term care providers, but they themselves face dire shortages in staffing, which means they have less capacity to admit individuals from, from the hospital. So they, they're stuck in the hospital. Uh, and so we want to try to increase that capacity in our long-term care facilities so we can get more people out of our hospitals appropriately. Obviously, that's contributing to the strain. So we're going to expand contracted staffing and dedicate more staff to provide care in our nursing homes to increase their capacity uh, to help patients who no longer need the intensive care in a hospital. We had already done this with 60 contracted staff in the months before. We're going to increase that by another 200, and that'll serve probably about 240 more residents that we can get out of our hospitals. We'll be able to serve uh, at least another 75 people also who need guardianships. Uh, we hope to increase our social service staff and area agency to help with the assessments that are necessary to help accelerate people being uh, allowed to go to a really more appropriate setting outside of a hospital. So we're going to acquire additional assessment staff to work with patients on transitioning and selecting providers in expediting their eligibility work to get assistance. We're also going to contract with the uh, area agencies on agency at high volume hospitals to help patients who are not relying on Medicaid for their transition. Uh, we also are creating a, a program to engage more guardians. Some of these folks who are not uh, competent to make decisions on their own uh, under current law require a guardianship. So we want to provide more resources to get more guardians so we can accelerate that process. This will help people without the capacity to make decisions and hopefully expedite people's transition out of hospitals into more suitable care. Now, we wish that was an overnight process, but we want to accelerate it as fast as we can by having more guardians to work on this. So we're also going to provide uh, uh, incentives for strike teams uh, for long-term care so that they can themselves, uh, you know, accelerate their staffing levels on their own employment. Now, uh, also a way to alleviate some of the stress on hospitals is to reduce the, the demands uh, for some of the, the work they do and the procedures they do. And this is one of the ways to increase capacity to deal with this Omicron uh, surge, obviously. So we are going to be uh, requiring hospitals to temporarily halt non-urgent procedures so as much capacity and staff can be dedicated to emergent needs, the people who need this right now, uh, not just for Omicron patients, but for heart attack victims, for car crash victims, for gunshot victims. They all need help right now. And uh, this is a difficult, but it is a necessary decision to make sure people get access that is life-saving right now. So many hospitals are already doing this to help utilize staff in other areas of the hospital. The University of Washington hospital system has already taken this action voluntarily and they have successfully redeployed staff to other areas of their hospital, make sure they can take care of these life-saving uh, issues. So uh, when we're looking across Washington, we really need to make sure that all hospitals are sharing this, this effort so that we can transfer people amongst hospitals depending on what their demands are and their staffing levels are. Uh, so basically, we gotta make sure all hospitals help each other to make sure that no one hospital goes to 
too deep into this capacity crisis. Now, I know this, uh, this is going to delay some care that we, we may want, and none of us should be happy about this. So I think we're appropriately disheartened to find ourselves in a situation that so many people are not vaccinated. And like I said, about 80% of our people in our, uh, who are being treated for COVID right now are not vaccinated. So we should not be help, happy that the fact that so many people are unvaccinated have put us behind the eight ball on this. But that is the situation. We should also not be happy about people spreading misinformation about this, this deadly disease and the vaccine. I was, frankly, I think everybody should be enraged about this internet hoax that Republican politicians yesterday scared the living daylights out of 30,000 people telling them they were going to be put in concentration camps if they weren't vaccinated. It was a bunch of baloney and it scared people to death. And that's got to stop. And I'm calling all Republican legislators to stand up and, and speak against this and denounce those who are responsible for this internet hoax. This is dangerous for our people to scare them like this. And it certainly makes it more difficult for our medical personnel to really help people save their lives. So uh, just a little bit more about this uh, decision. Look, the determination of what is urgent procedure is going to be left to the physicians in this regard. So if a physician identifies harm or a worsening condition or deteriorating health of a patient, uh, that procedure can still be done under the physician's discretion. So we're going to leave it in the capable hands of physicians to determine the appropriate needs uh, under this direction. Uh, that'll last for four weeks. We think that's a reasonable time, hopefully, to get through the peak of this. And we know people are working real hard. We want to thank everybody in these hospitals, everybody in the hospitals, for their incredibly hard work in this regard. We want to help them through these hard works. Uh, on top of this, we're also going to, I want to highlight the availability of a third-party contract. We've, our state has established a contract under which hospitals can order up staffing. And... Uh, Today, there are already more than 875 personnel that we have helped the hospitals to deploy that are on the job today. And we intend for another 200 that are traveling, uh, you know, to get uh, in harness today under that, what we've done for the hospitals there. But I want to strongly encourage hospitals to maximize that. There's another 125 personnel available to the hospitals to hire I really urge the hospitals to do this. Look, they've asked for the National Guard to step out of their civilian lives, and the Guard's going to do that. But we really need the hospitals to use this uh, uh, procedure to get more staff, even if they have to pay for it. Uh, we need this staff, and, and I really encourage them to, to utilize that. So if we can talk about masks for our workers, too, I, who have been working so hard, we also need to help hospital staff stay, stay safe. So I am requiring hospitals to operate in what we call conventional PPE status. And that means that a steady supply is available within hospitals so that coming back to work are confident they can be protected. Supply chain issues are not a challenge they once were. Our state does have access to appropriate PPE if hospitals are not available to access themselves, but we need them to protect our working, hardworking uh, personnel in our hospitals. Uh, I'd also like to issue a call for retired healthcare workers for the next few weeks. Look, even if you can help temporarily in a hospital, if you can help with testing or vaccinations or staffing a hospital or a long-term care facility in your neighborhood, hey, I hope you could consider helping. And you can go to waserve.org, that's waserve.org, to sign up to help. This crisis is, I hope, temporary, and we can use all the help we can get to give a little relief to our hardworking personnel and, and, and help save some lives, too. So thanks a million for thinking about this. Now, this is a long-term as well as a short-term problem. We've had a nursing shortage and other personnel shortage for some period of time. So we need to invest more uh, to uh, increase the pipeline of healthcare workers in our state. So my supplemental budget would invest about $30 million to remove delays caused by lack of training opportunities for nurses and others. This will allow nurses, nursing assistants, and medical assistants to achieve their 
professional requirements faster. We want to open up. We need more folks, even after the Omicron hopefully passes this by or at least reduced dramatically, we're still going to need more personnel. So I want to just mention uh, sort of some of the work we've done in the past, too. Since our announcement just what was it, a week and a half ago on increasing masking and testing access last week, our Department of Health has already sent out more than 2.4 million masks uh, through the local emergency management to schools and the public. And as I mentioned before, we really encourage people to up their game on masking, to get higher levels of efficiency in our masking above and beyond uh, just a cotton mask. This is an extremely contagious disease, and we hope that you will uh, think about that for your own personal protection and those along, uh, around you. We've also distributed since January 1st 2010 rapid at-home at tests for our partners to distribute to their local communities. Uh, millions of more tests are on the way, as you know. Uh, early next week, the Department of Health will release details on how individuals can access our portal for rapid in-home delivery uh, through Amazon. We hope that that's open next Friday. No guarantees, but that's a, we're shooting for that. And those tests will be, the access to those tests will be in addition to the FEMA testing sites in King County and Snohomish County, as well as the testing expansion that we're providing through the National Guard. Um, a quick update on our state employee vaccination requirement. As of today, our current state workforce is more than 99% in compliance, meaning they have the vaccine or an accommodation. This is an extraordinary accomplishment. We're very pleased about our success. And we wanna thank our dedicated public service for stepping up the plate. Uh, in this regard. By the way, I just comment on the Supreme Court decision regarding the federal uh, uh, proposed mandate. This will not, uh, we don't believe it will affect our operations in the state of Washington. There's nothing that we can, at least at the moment, that we see in the decision that would somehow necessarily alter our positions uh, in what they are in the state of Washington. So with that, we have uh, General Doggerty, Dr. Shaw, Lacey Fehrenbach, and Nick Struley available for us. Molly Advisor and Amber Leaders, who are also helping us on policy on uh, health care, hospitals, and behavioral health. So uh, feel free to ask them any questions you like as well. So when uh, you may fire when ready, Gridley. All right. Uh, first, we'll go to Rachel with AP. Hi, Governor. I know you said it would take a week or so to set up the testing centers, but when will the Guard members arrive at the emergency departments to help with staffing? And Oregon's deploying 1,200 Guard members to assist hospitals, so why only 100 in Washington? And then I have a question for Dr. Shaw or Lacey. Concerning the 43% increase in breakthrough cases that you announced this morning, can you clarify the time frame in which you saw that increase? And can you give a breakdown of how many people were boosted and whether there's a distinction depending on what type of vaccine someone has received. General, you wanna answer the guard questions? Sure, Governor, glad glad to do that. Uh, you know, the, the force structure in different uh, National Guard uh, states across our country is different. And uh, right now there are eight states, uh, nine when we count Washington that are doing this mission. And, um, you know, here in Washington, we have a lot of combat units. We don't have a lot of medical units. And so we just don't have a lot of medical capability to put out there. Um, and as the governor mentioned, um, you know, we've been heavily committed uh, to this pandemic along with a host of other missions to include fighting a couple of wars overseas uh, for, for quite some time. And most of our soldiers and airmen uh, were so heavily committed, they had just returned to their civilian jobs, whereas other states did not commit their National Guard early in this fight. And uh, so we have to try to balance our commitment to uh, respond to, to needs here within our state with our commitments to our civilian employers. And uh, while I've got the mic, I just wanna take this opportunity to thank our civilian employers who have been incredibly supportive and patient with us uh, over these last couple of years as we've done food banks and testing and vaccines and, and a whole gambit of things. So, so that, that's my answer to that question for you, Governor. Thank you. Thank you. And if I can add our guard, I don't know if there's a better guard in the United States. They have stepped up the play. They've been doing food delivery and, and, and shoveling snow and stacking sandbags. They have done everything. And these people have been working really hard the last few years. Now, the other thing we have to consider is when you when you do activate a guard, 
if you take a teacher out of a classroom, now all of a sudden maybe this, you know, the classroom doesn't have a teacher. If you activate them and they work for an airline, more airline flights get canceled. So you do have to balance these things. We think this will be helpful uh, to hospitals and we're, I'm glad we can do it. There was a question there for Dr. Shaw or Lacey, I think. Yes, um, and I just wanted clarification though, when are they arriving before we move on to the question for Dr. Oh, yeah. Shaw? Sure. Brett, when, when will, they, Jen, when, when will sure. they arrive? Sure, Governor. Yeah, we're uh, we're moving as quickly as we can. Uh, so we're hoping to have the whole team uh, in place no later than the 24th. We've got 17 right now on site that we think we'll be able to kick out a little bit quicker. Uh, but we need to coordinate with the hospitals, first of all, and, uh, and then move out according to their schedule as well. So we're working on it, but the 24th for everybody at the latest. Governor, hi uh, again, um, uh, Umer Shah, Secretary of Health for uh, Washington. I just want to, uh, first of all, thank you for your um, your proactive steps to help support our healthcare system. I know they're very important for what's happening in our system right now. Um, as for this question, a, a couple things, if I could add in context. One is that this uh, increase that we uh, described this morning was over the time frame of 2021. So it was essentially January of 21 through uh, the beginning part of 22. So it was that one year time frame. And there are a couple of things to just point out. One is that while breakthroughs uh, were highlighted, uh, what was also highlighted was that severe disease and uh, for example, hospitalizations was still at a, at a markedly low level. In other words, vaccines, even though someone may have had a breakthrough, they, it was either uh, mild disease or no symptoms. And that is really important for people to keep in mind. So I believe we quoted 3% on that press release. And I think it's really critical that we continue to, to keep that message out there. Um, I cannot give you, because uh, our team is still working on uh, the remote vaccination versus recent vaccination or someone who's gotten a booster. So it is true that this includes people who may have been remotely vaccinated, meaning eight months ago, 10 months ago, 12 months ago, but it also includes those who have been more recently vaccinated. Now our information thus far preliminarily looks as if it's those who were remotely vaccinated more than it is the ones that have gotten a recent vaccination and or a booster. So that's why we have been so focused on making sure people get their booster vaccine. Uh, Lacey, anything I've missed or does that cover it? Uh, yeah, I can quickly add, I think Rachel asked if we differentiate by type of vaccine. Um, we don't in the report. Uh, I also want to remind people that, you know, even when we see breakthrough cases, um, we really want to emphasize that the vaccine is extraordinarily protective against severe disease. Uh, depending on your age, um, if you are unvaccinated, you're eight to 11 times more likely to be hospitalized if you're unvaccinated than if you're fully vaccinated in Washington state. Thanks, Lacey. Great. Next question will come from Joe with the Seattle Times. Go ahead, Joe. Joe, can you unmute yourself too? If not, you can email me your question as well and we can come back to you that way. We will go to Laurel with the Smokesman Review in the meantime. Go ahead, Laurel. Wait, I'm issuing an executive order to figure out why we can't take Joe's calls. <laughs> Let's fix this, please. Have me, have me call Frank Blethin. Somehow we got to fix this. <laughs> um, Governor, I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first, we've heard from some local leaders and hospital leaders that where extra staff is really needed is long-term care facilities. So can you explain your decision to not send the National Guard to those facilities and only to hospitals? Um, and then secondly, on the guardianship issue, um, have you talked at all with legislators about possibly changing that law um, if you feel like you don't have the emergency authority to do so. Yeah, well, listen, the reason we sent guard to the hospitals is because the hospitals ask us for the guard to come to their hospitals and help them, and that's why we're helping them. Now, it is possible there might be some things we do in long-term care facilities, but we're handling that through this contract of hiring civilian personnel on the government's dime to go into the long-term care facilities to increase their capacity. So as I've indicated, we are adding capacity 
instead of the Guard, but using civilian personnel, which frankly are going to be needed long term anyway. The Guard is a short term assistance, but the long term care system really needs a longer term staffing increase no matter what. Even after we get through Omicron, we need to have more capacity. So it's a more reliable, longer term solution, and it can be due relatively rapidly. And we're doing it at, at significant uh, scope. Now, as I've indicated, we already have over 800 people in this project. Uh, we want to continue to uh, uh, to increase that. Uh, your other question, uh, tell me, remind me your other question. Yeah, we're gonna. We think we can serve about another 240 residents. That's a pretty big increase in long-term care capacity, and can can do it maybe even faster than the guard to get there. So we thought that was a superior way uh, to go. You asked another question. That I uh, yes, on the, the guardianship law and whether you're talking to legislators about possibly changing that um, if you don't have the emergency authority to do so. Yeah, I have not had a chance to talk to them um, about this. I do think it's worthy of consideration if there are ways that we can reduce any of the paperwork that's necessary if we have good family member support around a person that are trustworthy um, is there anything we can do to to make this this process faster? Sometimes it can take 60 days, sometimes longer. I'm hopeful that we find some way to make this a faster process, and it may involve more resources for superior courts even, so they got access to, to be able to hold these hearings. Or maybe there's some other solution. So I'm open to ideas uh, about this. All right, and I but do have just... Interim, I, I want to reiterate, we're not just sitting on the hands, right? We're going to hire more guardians to get this job done fast as we humanly can. And that's what we're doing. Governor, if it's okay for me to just add uh, that uh, we, um, long-term care facilities can also utilize the ACI contract that we have. And as the governor mentioned, we've already deployed over 875 staff uh, both through the hospital system, but also in some long-term care facilities. And so it's really critical that we continue to remember that today's announcement is, is not the first uh, set of actions. There have been actions that the state has taken throughout this pandemic, even recently, as we continue to provide support for our hospitals and our healthcare system. Thanks, Governor. Yeah, I, maybe that wasn't clear. The ACI contract is available for long term. We, we've already done this. I'll make this really clear. We're going to do hundreds more. So, And it's a longer term play to help boost the capacity of the long term uh, uh, situation. And I have just questioned. Hospitals, hospitals can use that contract too. I want to make that clear. There's 125 staff they can hire tomorrow under the ACI contract in these hospitals. And since they've asked the guard for taxpayers to pay for that, we are really hopeful that the hospitals can step up the plate and, and use that contract to its maximum. And we probably will be asking for additional contracting authority over time. All right, Joe's question that he mailed was for the governor or Lacey. Can you give some detail about the existing program that could allow for another 125 workers in hospitals around the state? And if that program is available, why aren't hospitals using it? Governor, maybe I'll jump in. I, I think you just said this. Uh, let's be, um, maybe help with some of the, the math here. Our ACI contract uh, has a ceiling uh, in terms of the number of people, uh, personnel that we can request and, and provide uh, as, a, as an institution gives us a request that we can provide to that institution. That, that ceiling is at 1,210. It's just over 1,200. Uh, eight, over 875 have already been deployed within the healthcare system. Another 200 are in process of being deployed. That leaves the 100 and whatever that is, 125 or 129 or 130 that are additionally able to be requested. They can be requested. So it's not that our hospitals and healthcare system have not been requested. We have been working with them, but the governor is saying that we have additional capacity there. And that 1210 ceiling is what we're also asking over time if we can increase that. And we do not have that in place yet, but right now we still have some additional staff that can be deployed to those hospitals through that ACI contract. 
Yeah, and just to make clear, that ceiling the doctor referred to is set by federal law. This is a federal program, so the federal law is that has that ceiling. We're going to ask them to raise it over time, but there's 125 available now. Now, why are hospitals, haven't they done this already? Uh, you need to ask them, but one of the issues they might be thinking about is that uh, to get full reimbursement through this, that can only be for treating COVID patients. So there's an administrative headache figuring out how you use that money. And if, you, if you're treating a non-COVID patient, then you have to do it on your own nickel uh, in the hospital. So that may be one of the reasons they, they haven't been in, is rapidly using this, but they need to, okay? We need to get these people treated and we need more staff. And so they need to step up the plate and hire these people. We're helping and the hospitals need to help. So I hope that they can take that action. Next question comes from Austin with Northwest News Network. Go ahead, Austin. Thank you, Governor. Just briefly, in light of that Supreme Court decision today affecting the Biden mandate, where does that leave you in terms of your thinking about a state level mandate for private employers beyond the healthcare sector to require that their employees get vaccinated? Well, I haven't read the decision in full, but our first analysis is it doesn't change our situation in Washington State. It was a decision about the ability of the OSHA agency under federal law to make a decision. So there's nothing in that decision that would narrow the state's capability under our own state law. But we are not at the moment intending to move in that direction on a requirement. So it neither accelerates or retards it. It leaves us kind of where we were, which is at the moment we're not, at least in the immediate future, uh, thinking about that immediate vaccine requirement. We're focusing on hospital capacity and getting people uh, you know, uh, the knowledge they need to get boosted and getting them access to masks. So that's what we're focused on at the moment. Next question comes from Jerry with the Everett Herald. Go ahead, Jerry. Make sure to unmute as well, Jerry. Okay, we will try Jerry after Shauna from McClatchy. Go ahead, Shauna. Good afternoon. Um, my question has to deal with um, the current healthcare workers. So a lot of, uh, or not a lot, but some healthcare workers are leaving or planning on leaving the industry due to burnout. So I'm curious what your long-term plan is to keep workers in the field now. Um, and how do you think the state can encourage nurses to stay at the bedside now? Well, the things we're doing, uh, we're trying to increase, we're trying to decrease their load by decreasing the number of procedures that have to be done so they can focus on the people with life-saving measures. That's the order involving non-urgent procedures. We're trying to get them additional help through the National Guard and the ACI contract. Um, uh, longer term, we are attempting to increase the pipeline of people to train and thereby deploy more, deploy more nurses. That's critical. And I've actually put money in the budget to do that. And we're also doing some things that are secondary, but very important. We're trying to get people vaccinated. So not so many people get sick. And I want to reiterate this. Your booster decreases the odds of you having a severe illness like maybe eight or nine or 10 times. And so trying to get people boosted and vaccinated, maybe that's the best thing I can do for nurses right now to, so that they don't have to work 23 hours a day. And I think all of us, I hope, will continue to work on this. You know, and frankly, again, that's one of my feelings of, frankly, anger at people who are lying about this vaccine and lying about our efforts to do something about it. You had these guys the other day who were running for Congress, who were Republicans, who used this to try to scare 30,000 people into think they're going into some concentration camp and to diminish our ability to fight this, this disease. We're obviously not going to do that, and that was never under consideration by anybody. And yet they're using this for political purposes. So I'm helping nurses by trying to share a little truth and standing up against these big lies and these internet hoaxes that Republican politicians are engaging in. That's helping nurses too, <laughs> by preventing people from getting sick in a serious way. 
So we're doing all we can do. And, and I just want to reiterate how hard they have been working. Listen, they, the, the stresses that nurses are under, you know, when you listen to nurses, when they talk to people who beg them for the vaccine, and when they go and they, they talk to the, their patients saying, we're going to have to intubate you, which is really a very difficult process. We don't know if you're going to wake up or not. And then the patient starts begging for the vaccine and they have to explain to the person it's too late. The vaccine can't help you now. That's a really hard thing for nurses and doctors to do. It's emotionally devastating, not just for the patient, but for the nurse. So we were, we're trying to reduce the number of times that conversation has to take place. Now, we're also increasing access to masking. Uh, my order today will go to the usual masking requirements. So up till now, they've, they've been able to, some of the hospitals have been able to use less effective masking. Well, they're no longer going to be able to do that. We're going to have to have totally effective masking available for nurses. Now, there is a bill also looking at some staffing requirements to impose additional staffing requirements on hospitals so that people are not overburdened. Uh, I haven't had a chance to look in that detail, but it's certainly worth a consideration to help our hardworking folks. Governor, if I could just add to what you just said, which is also we're asking our healthcare system partners also to help support their teams. You know, they, as, as you mentioned, and everybody should know, we're coming to, uh, just upon two years of this, of the first confirmation of a case in Washington. And so it's been two years that that healthcare system, that healthcare provider, a doctor, a nurse, a respiratory therapist, you know, anyone else in that healthcare system, they've had to go through ebbs and flows. This is our sixth wave. We're going through this just on and on and on. And it feels that there is a, an incredible emotional toll that's been taken on our healthcare providers. And so while we're doing everything we can as a state, I continue as a healthcare provider myself to just remind everybody of, of what is ahead here. But we also want to ask, and I know they have already been doing this, so this is not a new ask, but also making sure that our healthcare system partners are also doing what they can to support their team members who are going through some very difficult times. And then finally, Governor, as you mentioned, the messaging to our community members, do not go to the hospital or emergency department unless you have an urgent and emergency issue. Do not go there to, you know, to, to confirm a test that you received a positive result on for COVID-19. You know, do not go there if you have mild symptoms. This, there are messages that we really need to share with our community members because that hospital and healthcare system is truly stretched right now. We wanna do everything we can to do our part. And of course, get, get vaccinated, get boosted, and, and certainly wear your mask and be really appropriate to the risk you're taking in your everyday activities. We will go to Jerry with the Everett Herald one more time. Go ahead, Jerry. Thank you. I hope I'm unmuted this time. Appreciate taking the question. Uh, Governor, first, I think they're both uh, pretty quick ones. The, uh, can you just clarify, last week you had mentioned the National Guard, you had them ready, but hospitals needed to ask. So I just want to clear, did, did these uh, eight hospitals where you're deploying, did they make formal requests in the past week? And then my second question is, um, California has adopted a temporary rule where uh, nurses and healthcare workers who test positive but are asymptomatic are um, asked uh, to come back to work and keep working with COVID patients. Are you considering, uh, or did you consider such a policy for Washington in the short term? Well, I have not, and that's not to say we won't at some point, but at the moment, at the moment, we have not. Uh, on your first question, uh, listen, we've been talking to the hospitals for some period of time about how to help and there's been communications to figure out which hospitals it makes the most sense. And in one way or another, they requested and we responded and we got a good plan. By the way, I should note, this is a pretty unusual situation. I don't know if hospitals have been gone into a or guard has gone into a hospital before. So we're, we're being a little innovative here, but I am hopeful that, that it is going to work. By the way, Jerry, also, you didn't ask this question, we're gonna answer one. You asked about something I said, state in the state, I said, I said that the legislature has been a good partner in this response to COVID. And I noted that the legislature had 
had voted to confirm, I think, like 26 of my emergency orders. And you see, you wrote something to contest that. The legislature has done that by a majority vote. You noted appropriately that not everybody voted for it, but the legislature as a group voted to confirm at least 26 times my emergency orders. And I continue to confer with the legislators as recently this morning with the leadership of both chambers, and they seem to believe the decisions we're doing today make sense. So we're continuing to work in that partnership. But I got some Republicans who are continuing to lie about this vaccine and, and our efforts. I got Republicans running for for the, for the Congress saying we we're going to put people in concentration camps. What a bunch of malarkey. And Republican leadership won't denounce those people. It's been 18 hours and they haven't said boo about it. The Republican leadership should be denouncing those lies and those internet hoaxes. And I'm asking them to do that. Uh, we just cannot have one party lying about this vaccine and our ability to deal with it. Up next, we'll go to Keith with Como. Go ahead, Keith. Hey, Governor, today the State Hospital Association says it does believe you have the emergency authority to handle the guardianship questions for those who have loved ones, uh, uh, family members who are in the hospital rooms with them right now, able to make other legal decisions. They believe, and they sent you a draft proclamation for you to sign immediately to allow uh, those uh, people to bypass the guardians and get those people out into the long-term care facilities. Are you going to sign that and consider it immediately? And if not, why not? Well, I'll tell you what. I'm not going to tell them how to do heart surgery, and they shouldn't tell me what I have authority to do. Uh, we've talked to our attorney general about this in some depth. Uh, I want to help, I think I've made very clear that I want to help the hospitals accelerate this so that rational decisions can be made in a lawful way. And we're doing that by increasing the number of guardians. This is something that needs to be improved and I'm dedicating myself to do that in a lawful way. So when they serve on the Supreme Court and they have nine doctors who work for the hospitals on the Supreme Court, then they may make a different decision, but that's where we are right now. Listen, what they've actually asked me to do is ignore the law. They've actually asked me to basically say, just don't enforce it. I can't do that. I don't have authority to just say, don't enforce the law. Now, there are occasions where I can waive laws, but because of the intersection between federal law and state law here, you have to comply with federal law to admit somebody into a long-term care facility. I cannot waive federal law. And so... Maybe there's a way to say I'd be able to say people can walk out of the hospital, but that does not solve their problem because we have to get them into long-term care facilities as well. And under combination of state and federal law, that requires at the moment some guardianship proceedings. So I'm interested in talking to the legislature to see if there's a faster way to do business. I hope we can find something. Next question comes from Nicole with Cairo Radio. Go ahead, Nicole. Good afternoon, Governor. We know that some hospitals are telling staffers who have COVID to go back to work even when they're showing symptoms. How will the state ensure that infection isn't being spread to people who are in a weak state, even if they are not working with those who are technically immunocompromised? People still don't go to a hospital when they're feeling well, so surely these are society's most vulnerable here. How will the state step in to protect them? And then perhaps Dr. Shaw could clarify what immunocompromised exactly means in this context. Well, we have existing rules and we expect people to follow them. If you're saying people aren't following the rules, they should be following the rules. And I have not actually heard that. If you have, I haven't heard about that. If you want to call the Department of Health and tell us who those folks are, we am sure that we can look into that. But we do have a suite of rules to protect patients and we expect everybody to follow them. Now, could those rules change if there's new science? Yes. But at the moment, we expect everybody to follow the rules to protect people. You want to add anything, Dr. Shaw? Uh, thanks, Governor. Uh, Nicole, can you just clarify when you said what immunocompromised means with respect to the patients that they're taking care of? I just want to make sure I'm understanding your question. Right. Well, what um, what we have found out is that one hospital chain in particular, MultiCare, is telling COVID-positive staffers that as long as they have been fever-free for 24 hours, 
they they may go back to work they should go back to work uh, but they should not be working with immunocompromised patients however it did say that they um, should work with those patients who have tested positive for covid or who have been vaccinated yeah so we can follow up with uh, with that uh, healthcare entity you know in general when we say immunocompromised it's referring to individuals that either because of uh, you know cancer treatment or they're on chronic steroids, uh, or they're, for, for example, or perhaps a, a patient on dialysis, that when we say immunocompromised in general, it refers to individuals in that kind of a state that, that may require uh, additional steps to protect them. Uh, individuals that may be immunocompromised uh, also include uh, those living with HIV AIDS. So this is how it's classified. And the, the reason why I wanted to clarify with that is that the CDC uh, had also put a list of what immunocompromised meant uh, as they were going through the various guidelines for vaccinations and other efforts out there during this pandemic. So we can follow up with uh, this institution and try to figure out what exactly they're telling the individuals. Again, as the governor has said, we want to make sure that our healthcare workers are protected themselves, and we also want to make sure that they are protecting their patients. Uh, and how do you do that? Well, one is the masking, but the other is to get boosted. I'm very concerned that we have healthcare workers who were vaccinated well early in the process of the vaccines being rolled out, but they have not gotten their boosters yet. They're, for whatever reason, waiting. And my plea to healthcare workers is do not wait. Get your vaccine booster today because you are both risking yourself and to your question, you're risking potentially the patient that you are caring for. So, you know, if anyone in our community, in our state, in our country needs to get a booster, it is absolutely our healthcare workers. They are the ones that we need to get them to have a recent vaccination, a booster, something that protects them because a remote vaccination from months and months and months and months ago, when, some, when a healthcare worker is eligible for a booster, they need to get it today. Next question comes from Joey with Puget Sound Business Journal. Go ahead, Joey. Hi, Governor. Going back to the uh, Supreme Court decision today, and I, I know it's not even been a full day yet, but uh, is there anything that gives you reticence about following up with a, a state mandate, expanding what you've already done, given you know your emphasis on making sure folks are getting vaccinated, and as well as the efficacy of your previous mandates? You know, is there anything that's giving you pause about going forward with a, a plan you had previously wanted to follow? Well, there's nothing in this Supreme Court decision that would give me any additional reticence. There's nothing in there to suggest the state has a diminished capability of protecting people in that decision. It's not based on a constitutional premise. It doesn't say anything about the lack of state's abilities to move forward. It simply, as I understand it at the moment, was a decision about whether the federal agency has had the ability to do a regulation. So. There's nothing in the decision that has changed my thinking on this. But there are some things, obviously, you know, that are reasons we have not to date issued a state requirement. Uh, one of which is that people are under very stress right now to try to operate their businesses. And it's something that we keep in mind. They're dealing with a lot of illness. And it's kind of a chicken or egg issue. We'd like to reduce the amount of illness by getting people boosted. But on the other hand, employers have to deal with extreme you know, uh, human resources challenges right now and adding to this with this rule, I'm aware of that. I'm not unaware of that concern. So we're, we don't have any imminent decisions to issue something like this, but I would not eliminate it for all time from our consideration. And uh, listen, I wanna reiterate this thing about getting boosters. It, it's just nuts. To, if you got the first two, there's no reason not to get the booster. And it's really important I am concerned people think, well, I heard that things might have plateaued in New York, so if I can just wait this thing out for another couple of weeks, I'll be okay. No, that doesn't work. Omicron's gonna be around for quite a period of time after the peak goes down. You're still gonna be under risk. And the booster is so much more effective than the first two shots, so much more effective. Like, I don't know, maybe two, three times more effective in, in keeping you out of the hospital with a serious illness. Yeah, you might get 
you know, flu-like symptoms, but it keeps you from getting dead, so to speak, to mangle English. And so really important for people to get boosted right now. And Governor, I, I want to just add to your message, which is a booster, uh, some folks are saying, well, gosh, if, if Omicron is giving mild symptoms, why do I need to get boosted? Well, the re reminder is that you don't know who's going to have the mild symptoms, who's not, but also you may be transmitting that virus to someone else in your community, in your neighborhood, in your family, or your workplace, with, who may actually have a more serious outcome. And that's why we are really, really wanting people to do everything they can to get their boosters. Thanks. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions. Next question comes from Ian with CREM. Go ahead, Ian. Uh, Governor Inslee, I was just wondering, um, are there any plans to deploy the National Guard to serve as bus drivers in school districts where there's a shortage of drivers? And also, uh, has the state received any requests from the Spokane Regional Health District when it comes to maybe helping with testing efforts? Uh, we don't have any current plans for use as bus drivers. One of the issues is it takes, you know, some period of time to train bus drivers. So, you know, you can get a, a member of guard to train up in a day or two to do testing, but it takes weeks and weeks to train as a bus driver. So as far as an immediate solution to that, we don't think it probably can help very much. Um, I don't believe we have any requests from the from Spokane outstanding. Dr. Shaw, have you heard anything in that regard? Uh, Lacey, let me let me add, Jen. I, I think he was referring to Spokane. I thought Spokane Regional, as in uh, the health department or the hospital. So, just want to clarify which which entity you were referring to. Uh, we were referring to the uh, health district, but I guess we can add hospitals to that too. Yeah, because remember, as the governor said, we are uh, deploying um, some of the the National Guard to uh, the Spokane. Um, hospital uh, side of the house, but I'm not aware of any additional uh, requests that we've had from our local health department in Spokane. And I will say that we continue to uh, work with all local health departments across the uh, entirety of the state to be able to know what their needs are. And also, uh, we're also encouraging them to work with their hospitals and their healthcare system. So at the local level, those local health departments are also working with the local hospital system so they can continue to, to really do some uh, important and at times innovative actions that they can take together so they can you know, help with the crunch that they're seeing in their communities. Lacey, is there anything that you know with Spokane? Uh, no, other than we're in continuous conversation with their health district, their healthcare coalitions, and if they need resources, whether it's test sites, mobile teams, um, staffing, you know, we can absolutely work to fulfill them. Last question comes from Leo with Publicola. Go ahead, Leo. Thank you. Hi, Governor. I was just wondering, um, when it comes to hiring civilians to staff long-term care facilities, what is the state going to do to, I guess, encourage people to take those jobs because they seem scary and risky and like you could get COVID and working in a new environment you haven't worked before and uh, CNA jobs pay a little bit above minimum wage. What's going to make people want to take these jobs at this time? Well, uh, we are going to pay them to start with out of the state treasury and, you know, for a couple hundred people. So it's a significant investment we're making. And we're going to hope that they would enjoy helping people. What you find is people who work in these industries typically care about people. They take, they take enjoyment for being compassionate. And thank goodness we've got people who, who really love people. And, you know, sometimes it's amazing what people do to express that love for each other. You know, it's like when I go into our mental hospitals. You know, I think many of us might not think of ever working in a mental hospital. But when you go into a mental hospital and you see the care that people have and the emotional bonding with their patients, it's 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 a beautiful thing. And so I think people can find that, do find that long-term care facilities. I certainly have experienced with, with my family. I have a 104-year-old mother-in-law, and the people that work for her are just the most caring, loving connecting people. They're just wonderful. And I think that's all over the state. 
So we're going to find those folks and make sure they're trained. Any final words, Governor? Yeah, I did want to add something. Someone asked a question about why I just don't solve this guardianship issue. I do want to make clear that I, I need to follow the advice of our attorney general. We got an excellent attorney general. He's now defended me. I've, I've been sued 42 times, uh, uh, alleging that my decisions have been unlawful about this COVID. And he has prevailed 42 times. Uh, and so I appreciate his talents. And the attorney general has reviewed this issue and, and believe that I'm doing what I can do. And I'm, I, I need to listen to that advice. So I respect hospitals, opi hospitals' opinions, but I respect the attorney general's more at the moment. I think that's an appropriate thing. Um, listen, this is going to be a tough few weeks for us in Washington State, and everyone's going to have some portion of frustration in some way. We've had canceled airplane flights. We've had canceled, you know, school bus routes. On occasion, there's been some supply chain interruption. I think all of us are going to have some uh, ability to exercise our, our powers of patience here to get through this together. And I hope that everyone will pull together as much as they can to help us get to the other side of this. But I do believe there's a reason to believe there is another side, and it's not that far off. So I hope uh, we're all pulling together in the next few weeks. With that, please be well. Take care.